We are fortunate to have Professor Michael Pesch, Associate Professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Pesch joined UT Austin in 2017 after a successful career of 13 years in the industry as a reservoir modeling, data analytics, research scientist, team leader, and program manager. While working in the industry, Professor Pesch published many articles and a book on geostatistics. And now, as a professor, he's producing a lot of material and sharing it with the students, professors, and professionals around the world. Personally, I have benefited many times with this material, from his material, not only on the technical side and geostatistics, but also on the human side. I've been cheered up and motivated by his tweets, YouTube lessons, and many other comments and excitement that he puts into everything he does. The topic of today's talk is deciding between academia and industry. Most of us are graduate students. Some of us decided about going into academia, some others industry, but many are still undecided. So what could be best than asking and learning from someone that has already successfully driven the industry road and is now having a great impact in academia? Without further ado, Professor Persh, please, uh, whenever you are ready. Thank you. Raymond, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It warms my heart. It really does get me just feeling stoked to hear that the content I share is helpful. That's really help, That's really important to me. I do appreciate that. Can everybody see my screen? Okay. I want to invite anyone who's not on video and who is comfortable to turn on their video to turn on the video and participate. I like, I like the whole when I'm talking, I can see people, you can react, I can ask questions. If you want to turn on your videos, please, I welcome you to do that. Thank you very much, Camero, for doing that. I appreciate that. Also, it's okay for people to unmute and jump in any time, right? I like it like that. If it's interactive, free form, jump in any time. Thank you very much, Diane. I appreciate you showing your video and all. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I've been asked to talk about deciding between academia and industry. And, and really all I can do is I, I just got, we just talked about significance, right, Katerina? And then really I'm a sample size of one. I'm N equals one and I recognize that, okay? And so I, my situations are unique. All I can provide is my personal experience my observations on the two lives that I've lived. That's all I can give you, but I'll do my best. Uh, let me put a couple more caveats down. First of all, I speak from experience. I'm sharing my ideas, my thoughts in the hope that they're helpful. I hope they don't come across as boastful, like I'm bragging or something like that. It's not, I just wanna be very frank and I'm gonna be very positive, but I'm outside my technical field of expertise. When I first joined this call with Renman, I said this was the toughest presentation I put together in a long time because it's not, I'm used to technical subjects, right? And this is different. Um, this is, um, my experiences are unique. I hope they're helpful. I'm not trying to boast. I have biases. Everybody has biases. So let me just declare them. I am generally a very positive person. No matter where I go, what happens, I'm kind of one of those glass half full type people. I'm pretty enthusiastic about life. Everywhere I go, I kind of just get along with everyone. And I'm also very direct in my communication. I do, I think I do a good job of advocating for myself. And I think that does help me in, in everything I've done. I also am first generation. I grew up in a very low income home. I don't want to go too much information, but there was alcoholism. There's lots of problems. And for me, education was an escape. It was a chance to have a much better life than I had ever seen as a child. Now I support a family of five. Two of my kids are in college now. I'm putting them through college, UT uh, Austin. One of them's in chemical engineering, same building I'm in, which is really funny. And the other one's uh, an Aggie, uh, psychology. So in a totally different area. So what does that mean? My values are unique and some of my values growing up in a low income situation, long term security for my family is paramount to me. And that drives my decision making and you'll see it affected decisions I made. Education was an opportunity to escape the challenges of my childhood. And so I value education and I see its importance too. And that's part of the reason I'm back in academia. Okay, I hope that's helpful to provide some of my biases tell you about my experiences. I hope that was okay to share. I also feel that I've been very fortunate. When I look back at my life, I really feel at every turn, things kind of turn out pretty well. The company that I worked for and the school that I joined, I rank them both as excellent. 
Um, I'm not mentioning the company by name. I'm not trying to represent the company, but my interests and my skills were well aligned to my former employer's objectives. And I was recognized and rewarded for what I did. And I think that's a very good thing. That was very important for my success. It was a large company with a major research organization. Two floors above, two floors below, we all had PhDs. You know what I mean? If we called each other doctor, we'd be just saying doctor all day long. It was, we were all, and people down the hall were people I had cited in my PhD. Like I was surrounded by really respected, um, great researchers. I was hired into academia with tenure. Um, actually, I'm very fortunate. 2017, I was the only person, as far as I know, who was hired directly into that university with tenure without university experience elsewhere. And um, so I really do feel that that was fortunate. So when I talk about academia, I know I'm not discussing the assistant professor role and the pressure to up or out. I know that's a lot of stress. And so I know I don't understand that. So I apologize for that. Um, I also had everywhere I went, I've had excellent mentors and peers. And I feel like in both sides, the chair of the department now, um, the senior faculty I work with, and then in the company, people, amazing people I work with who are always great mentors. Okay. To summarize, there is a parallel universe, I hope, you know, not to get kind of metaphysical, but if there was, uh, there is a Michael Perch with shorter hair who stayed in industry and guess what? I'm still happy. It's unhappy. I wish I could live both lives. Okay, was that too much preamble? Maybe a little bit too much. Let's talk about day one, industry versus academia, okay? Day one in industry, you show up, you go up the escalator, shiny, clean, everything looks great. You met by team leaders, you go through ergonomics, training, you sit down at your desk, an ergonomic specialist sits down and measures you and the desk. Make sure you're comfortable, make sure everything's good, your workstation is top of the line, set up, everything's ready to go. You know what I'm saying, right? Day one academia. You stand in front of an old wooden desk covered with dust and dirt in an office nobody else wanted. The keyboard is sticky, did you do you know what i'm saying am i am i being is this unusual no when i arrived to my previous institution many people did not even know i would be arriving so you're good <laughs> <laughs> right like i remember okay so I, that first day they sent me to go get a picture for my student id they had to retake it because there was that moment where i had the realization of what i'd walked away from and the fear returned i was like oh my Gosh, I just moved my family. I walked away from a 401k and a pension. You know what I'm saying? Like I, it was, it was amazing. So I think day one, I, I think we know kind of larger organizations are different when it comes to type, how they onboard, how they deal with people, how they set you up and so forth. I, is that fair to say? People are nodding. I agree. I agree. Professional societies and publishing. There can be a difference in your visibility. I advise my students and anyone I mentor to remain visible. Company or academia, participate in professional societies, continue publishing. If you go into a company, please, when you interview and you ask the company critical questions, find out their strategy when it comes to publishing and intellectual property. What I found was that if you work within their strategy for intellectual property, be it patent, publish, trade secrets, and so forth, that usually you can publish from the perspective of demonstrating company of choice, professional development, and support. Uh, I also had support to teach short courses in professional societies and also to publish. As mentioned when I was introduced, I wrote a book while working full-time at a company. Now, I got to admit, that was pretty awesome because there was literally, would you believe there was a lawyer from that company who had to read my book? Because they had to establish that there was no IP that was being released in the book that belonged to the company. So they had to read my book. I, I bet they're good at geostats now. So there's those aspects right there. What I found is if you work within that system, I published 40 peer review publications while I worked in a company. And I was able to do it. I, it worked pretty well. The, the thing about academia that's interesting to me is you're really unlimited in your participation. 
In fact, you can, you can kind of do anything. The freedom as far as participating in professional societies and publishing, really it's giving your time and funding to attend to these things that are really your limitations. Uh, professors on the call, faculty, am I speaking correctly? Have I got that about right? To, to the extent of my experience, yes. I, I guess my, my question was more like for, for your engagement while you were in industry, was that, were you driven just by like pure intellectual thirst and just like need to communicate? Or did you have in your back of your mind that at some point you might want to return? Uh, because like, if I do my math right, you have three kids, right? And if, if, if two of them are in college, you partly, they were, they were toddlers and elementary school kids mm -hmm. as you were doing all of that. So, I mean, what drove you? And, and, and Katerine, that's a really good comment. The thing that's very interesting, and this is where I benefited from alignment with the company values, they had in this company, this large company, what they call fellows. And a fellow is like a chief engineer position. Now, because of my hard work and all of my kind of the things I had developed and done, they saw me early on as kind of a person moving towards that position. Now, part of that position is an expectation that you're internationally recognized for your expertise, which means you have to be publishing. And so that was part of the excellent alignment. Now, if you ask me if I wrote the book and continue publishing because I thought one day I'd go back to academia, I always wondered. I always thought that was a possibility, yes. Yeah, I, I, I did love it. I, to be honest, when I took the job at the very beginning, I thought, when I thought about the faculty, the many faculty I really enjoyed listening to were the ones who had like experience doing experience, you know, practical experience. And so my, my initial plan was get five years practical experience and then come back to academia was a thought. That, that's something, I mean, that's something I observe frequently in geotechnical engineering. I mean, people who, you know, don't get an academic job the first time around and don't land a postdoc, they go to industry, maintain momentum for a year or two and then slowly tapers off. Yeah. So perhaps three years but then you know and depending on the type it also depends on the type of research that you do if you do more like open source computational stuff it's easy yep. to stay um productive if if your experience is more like on the experimental side research wise it, it's hard to like have access to the facilities to we we deal with a lot so yeah i okay. i i really publishing for about two to three years from a PhD, basically just by momentum, yeah. right? You have that kind of inertia, you were going, and now you just kind of finish up, keep finishing up some stuff. At some point you have to be, it has to be driven by new work. Yeah. And so clearly I did benefit from working in something that was relative port, relatively portable and was identified as an area that we wanted to demonstrate our capabilities through publishing. So I do recognize that, yes. Yeah. But, but I do, you know, one thing that was interesting was when I was in industry, I had been offered uh, a couple of times tenure, tenure track positions right after my PhD and about three or four years into my company experience. Yeah. And um, I, I had been warned at that time that the door closes. That if I go, but I do think that by continually publishing, and it may also be that the University of Texas, Austin, you know, my yeah. departments that I work in, they do tend to respect the industry experience. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. There's a lot of, there's a lot of good thoughts around but, this. But I, 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 I think, and, and I don't, I don't want to talk anymore so that the students can ask, but I, I, I think you bring up a good point for people to keep in their back of your, in their minds that, you know, understanding how each um, company positions itself in terms of, you know, growing cap intellectual capital is something important to pursue like even right now on top of my head i can think of two companies in geotechnical engineering and i know people in there that you know they keep publishing others are more like you know eh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so okay. yeah i, I appreciate it i oh and thank you for that and in fact to enforce that i graduated a similar time as some of my peers who disappeared and part of that was they went to companies that did not support 
uh, participation in the community, the scientific community. And so this is part of your uh, thought process as you interview and join companies, for sure. All companies have very different philosophies, or many do. Yeah. Um, the, uh, quick question. Sorry. Please, go um, ahead. Uh, on that note of like during the interview process, asking companies, you mentioned some things to like consider asking. Uh, aside from publishing, I guess, philosophies, um, you mentioned something else, but I, I wasn't sure what it was. Uh, so company of choice, was it discussion around company of choice? Uh, yeah, um, I IP think it strategies. was that. Yeah. It's so, IP so strategy. Um, what exactly does that mean? Yeah. Right, so ahead. companies develop intellectual property. And for many companies, intellectual property includes technology, workflows, methodologies, um, instrumentation, equipment that they develop. It may also be just data. It may be, uh, you know, kind of standards. It can be very broad what IP is, intellectual property. Well, companies have different strategies around intellectual property because it adds value. There's a couple of things you can do. If you publish, you commit it to the you know, uh, public domain, right? To out to the public, in which case that can be beneficial because you can actually raise the capabilities of your peers. You can actually demonstrate your capability as a company to potential partners because other companies will see that, oh, look, you develop great technology. Um, we can see things coming out the door kind of thing. So there's all kinds of now things like patenting is when you want to somehow have control of that. Now, not my expertise to get into, but as a team leader and program manager, I was involved in the strategy kind of discussions and I understand something around it. Companies are very different. In the sector I was working in, there were companies that basically patented everything, trade secrets and no publishing. I, I, as, a, as a person who's interested in research and publishing, I, I would be interested in companies that actually favor and allow for that. And there's many in my sector that do. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. These are good considerations. I love this because it's not just considerations for the choice, but then what do you do if you're already determined to go to industry? How do, because I don't know about you, but I like doing science. I like publishing, even if I work in a company, right? Activity fragmentation. You know the old adage, if you like research, well, you know, the best time of your life to do research is during your PhD, right? Because as you get through to postdoc, assistant professor, associate professor, and by the time you get the full professor, you know, this is a great pie chart from uh, Paul over at the University of Minnesota. This is an estimation of the types of activities for a assistant professor. And so just to get a sense of it, and I'll tell you what, as a professor, I feel this. I, I have 13 PhD students. I have a consortium. I'm a principal investigator in natural sciences in an uh, entire uh, undergraduate freshman research initiative. I'm um, a core faculty in the machine learning lab. I do so many things and we can feel pulled in many different directions. I think the faculty on the call would support that. What's interesting to me that is an in industry, if you work in research, I remember working with my team and considering two or three projects to be fragmentation. Two or three distinct projects being seen as too much fragmentation for one person. Um, as a manager, I was getting fragmented, but never at the same level as um, what I've seen in academia. In academia, you wear every hat like all of the things you have to do with your students and your people, um, you can feel that your weekday evenings and weekends are time to actually do your job, <laughs> right? To try to catch up, <laughs> right? Okay, I hope that doesn't come across as negative, but definitely when it comes to focus, I do feel that industry has kind of this, pers they have something really good there. Um, I saw people working six months, a year, two years on the same project. If you're working in a research lab, so they do at times in certain organizations have patients that do real strategic research, which was really exciting. And you could be on a team with three people working together on that same project or four multidisciplinary team teaching. Okay. And jump in anytime if you have questions or comments teaching in the industry, you can, do you have that desire to teach? I know myself, those days that I came home, just really happy from work were the days that I was teaching or mentoring. It makes me happy. It cheers my heart. I love the lecture hall. 
80 students, teaching them something brand new, that's a great day, right? Teaching two to four weeks a year internally, if you're just a regular technical subject matter expert, is pretty typical if you work in research or technology in a company um, because you're seen as an expert to share your knowledge with other people on your team and throughout your company. Guest lectures at universities are very much supported. You do that and it's seen as a great way to promote the company. Future grads will consider coming to the company. It can be very good. Academia, if you have stage fright, that's going away very quickly because you're going to be constantly teaching. Like I, I, I'm all the time, it just happens where you're suddenly in a room and next thing you know, you're giving a lecture constantly at any moment, you're going to be teaching to large groups. Or, and what I would say when I compare teaching in the industry and academia, you are driven to deeper understanding, greater rigor when you're in academia. Would you believe that you can't hand wave with 80 intelligent undergraduate or graduate students in a lecture hall? Somebody's going to call you out. Somebody's going to be like, oh, come on. How do you solve that? How do you really do that? And so what I find is that you really can't baffle these questioning, knowledge-seeking undergraduate and graduate students. It will drive you. And you know the best way to learn something, right? Teach it, right? Katerina, you got full marks for that. I totally saw that. You, I saw that. You said teach it, right? And then write it. <laughs> and then write it up. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So giving back an altruism. Do you have a burning desire to give back for the things that, you know, kind of pay it forward, all the great things that happen in your, your life, you want to help society? Well, you can work, many great companies have days of caring, volunteer activities in the community. We volunteered in Habitat for Humanity, and I found out that I have very bad aim with a hammer. I apologize for the supervisor. I hit their thumb. I'm so sorry about that. But, you know, all of the, we do have those opportunities to, and the company will do matches and we'll do all kinds of things to support you in the altruism. In academia, it's a whole different level. I share every one of my lectures. I share all of my educational content with anyone in the world. I hear from people all over the place who are using my content to learn about this. I get to volunteer like three weeks every summer to teach underrepresented students to encourage them to stay in their degrees and go to grad school. You know, I, I'm excited by that. Like we can really change the world. That's the feeling I have. What do you think? It's a, it really is amazing. I saw the heart symbol there. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Adeline. All right. Um, Work-life balance. You guys knew this was going to come up, right? I already talked about the working on the weekends, the evenings, and so forth. Let me tell you about industry. If you're in industry, like a good company, the culture will promote and support work-life balance. There will be some schedule inflexibility. It may be difficult within the HR policy to say, I want to work from home every, you know, one day a week or something. Often, you know, there'll be difficulty around that. Maybe things are different now with the whole COVID and, you know, we perceive remote work now. If you are in your office every night at 7 o'clock p.m. and your boss walk, walks by and sees that, if they're a good supervisor, they're going to sit down with you and have a talk. And they're going to be, what's going on with your job? What's going on with your responsibilities that you can't get it done in regular office hours? What can we do to help you manage that? We want you to be healthy for the long term. That was the message I always got in industry. Good companies care for their people. And when they do that, they do focus on promoting work-life balance. I, I did not see the culture of, oh, look, I stay late. Kind of like it was a showing off thing. No. I didn't see that. We had every second Friday off. I had hobbies. I refloored my house over a couple of weekends. I was I wrote that book with that time. I did things. Academia, I do, since I've become a professor, I work most weekends, long days during the weekdays. Um, it really is constant, the things I have to do to kind of keep up with it. I do have more schedule flexibility. And everybody kind of knows that about academia. You kind of you kind of make your own schedule. You're your own boss. But there is constant opportunity and need. And my problem is, and I think it's me. I think I just get too excited by everything. And I think I want to help out too many things. And it can overwhelm you. Um, in, in academia, I don't know if anyone will ever come up to you and tell you that you've done enough. Nobody. Nobody will. Nobody will. All you'll kind of know is that, oh, in the school, there's that person who won the Nobel Prize. 
do, do you know what I mean? Like there's those people who just got inducted to the Academy of National Academy of Engineers or whatever it was. And, and that's kind of the measuring stick. Otherwise, as your junior faculty, it's like, wow, how do you keep up with it? You know, did that sound negative? Not intended to be negative. I'm just saying that it, it, there is a difference mentality and so forth, work-life balance. Comments? No, I think this is this is spot on. Okay. This is spot on. I, I, I think the, the appeal is also that the, you can choose. Like you said it yourself, you, you can choose. You, you choose to be excited by teaching. You choose to be excited by research. You don't have to... You know, one one can one can pick what is their. You know, it's kind of like pick your poison, right? Um, and so, but there's no ceiling. That that's for sure. No matter where you are, there's no ceiling. You, you kind of like have to define it. And, and you know what? I there are those professors who have consistently five students, a regular stream of publications. They keep the students funded. They teach their standard courses. And they settle in. So in, from this perspective, I may not be the best judge because I'm still early. I'm still putting together lots of content, getting things started and so forth. So, yeah. The um, professional experience and freedom. I really, you know, what was interesting to me that in industry, in, in good companies, you have an ability to direct your career trajectory over a variety of defined paths. subject matter expert, you know, where I become like that technical fellow, that chief engineer one day, I, I could do, I could direct that path. Now I got to tell you early in my career, I had that, you know, that discussion where somebody comes up to you and says, uh, do you want to be one of those people who sit on the plane with the laptop open all the time, you know, and go through the positions very rapidly, move around, go, you know what I'm talking about, that program. Somebody came to me and said, hey, you, you're a good communicator. You're very technical. You seem like you have these skills. Do you want to try that out? And I said, no, because I wanted to remain technical. And I had the ability to define that path. Now, at the same time, I had the ability to work in interdisciplinary teams and learn and develop skills in geophysics, uh, further skills in stratigraphy and based in analysis and geology, because I've always been a half a geoscientist, half an engineer. So I had those abilities to kind of direct my learning, my skills, and to grow and change over my career. So I really appreciate that. Academia, how can you beat that? You have the ability to chase your scientific interests. Like I, I, I spent the afternoon, to, I, I was talking to Dr. Kares, Professor Kares at Stanford. His ideas on a global sensitivity analysis approach to understand subsurface uncertainty is revolutionary. It's changed the way we think about uncertainty. And he could do that because he works in an environment which he, he's trying to change the world, you know? And, and I love that. I, I really, I was really excited about that. You can reinvent yourself. You know, to be honest, don't tell anyone, oh, you're gonna post this online, aren't you? Okay, it's fine, it's fine. I didn't do that much with machine learning before about four years ago. Nope, I, I had to teach it to myself. Well, I already was doing geostats, data-driven statistical modeling and all. And, and then basically put the course can, content together, get my students researching in that area. And within a quick quick time, you can start to build new comp competencies. You can be very entrepreneurial in academia. I have a education startup company. I taught 1,700 working professionals last year in 44 engagements. It was, it was really fun. I'm, I'm looking at other startup companies that I may be joining in to do some really cool stuff in robotics and otherwise. Like you can, the entrepreneurial opportunities, I'm working to support the state of Texas for groundwater. Like it's incredible to what degree you can get involved in, and, and universities want to see you involved in practice, which is really, really exciting. It's really unlimited in what you can do. Well, it'll be limited by number of hours you're allowed to spend and so forth. Okay, questions about professional experience and freedom. Um, I have a question. Go um, ahead, Laura. So I'm really curious about your perspective on kind of having that mentor at the very beginning of your career. In the industry, it's pretty obvious that the older engineers that are more experienced really teach you and really guide you along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in academia, I'm not really sure how it works. I, I feel like, like, are you just alone or who do you refer to when you have uh, questions? Laura, that's an awesome question. And, and I think you really nailed it there because like in, in industry, 
they literally like in many companies, it's like you're almost going through another degree. You, you, you finish, you join the company and you're put into some type of a uh, apprentice type program where you go through formal training. You have a mentor who oversees you and guides you, helps you kind of build the skills you need. I went through that the first four years or so in industry. It was very good. Even after that, you have great team leaders. Would you believe that in industry, they teach leadership skills? They teach great leadership skills. That's something that, that great companies do. And what you'll find is that those leaders will inspire you. They'll teach you how to be a leader. They'll, you'll be mentored in all of that. Academia, it's a little more free form, but I got to tell you, my department has been wonderful. A full professor was assigned to me. In some departments, it's more than one professor. I drop in on poor professor, um, uh, Mohanty. I just drop in on him. He's always willing to discuss with me. And I mean, very like anything, like I'll just drop in and say, listen, I'm about to sign this confidentiality agreement with this company. Am I allowed to do that? Or I'm about to talk to someone from the media. Should I talk to someone first? You know, that kind of stuff. And, and always just jumping in with great information. The chair of our department has been excellent too. Um, we have a associate director, uh, like an HR manager in the department who's been very good. Um, we even have a communications person who I can go to and give me advice on how to communicate external to the off campus. So I, you know, it's interesting. You don't have a formal training program with a path in, uh, that you made in industry, but I have found that in a good department, the senior faculty, Faculty want to see junior faculty succeed. And so they invest in you, they help you. Yep. I had a full professor come to me and just say, hey, why don't you help co-supervise the student? I'll cover it, don't worry about it. Like, can you imagine how great that is for a brand new faculty? Like I, I probably, I bet I cried a little bit when I was so, so excited to have that opportunity, you know, and be mentored by them. Uh, I'll tell you one thing I do do is I have 13 PhD students, eight of them are co-supervised. Now, part of that is because I'm data analytics, stats, and machine learning, it's integrated. Everything I do is integrated with other domains. But I also enjoy the fact that I get to learn from these people. Okay, good. Thank you, that was very insightful. No, thank you for the question, Laura, I appreciate it. Okay, collaboration. Industry, in a good company, you have a win together attitude. The culture is we will win together, collaboration is rewarded. The best thing you can do at the end of the year is you provide a long list of individuals who you helped, stakeholders who can say, oh yeah, 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 Michael did this, Michael did that, it added value. Um, diverse subject matter experts all working together on teams, which is really, really fun. I got to, anybody know Henry Postman here? works in uh, seismic geomorphology. If you ever have a chance, see one of his talks at AAPG. Fantastic. It's just, it's like going to a great movie. You want to bring popcorn. And um, Henry Postmature, I got to be mentored. I got to work with him in some of the problems. It was amazing. Tim McCarg, others. Academia, you can work with anyone in the world. You can form partnerships with other academics, you know, NSF grants or whatever federal funding or what you form teams which is really interesting. And there's synergies anywhere you can do anything with anyone. Um, so I think both of them are excellent when it comes to collaboration. Here's a picture of some of my old colleagues from the company I used to work at. And here's a picture as a professor teaching inside of a company. So I do see great collaboration, both sides. Data. Oh, Katerina, you have I, a comment. Can I add something to that? So, so in, in academia, and I think that the, the landscape is changing a little bit because there's there's used to be this notion that you have to be completely independent, completely on your own, like especially for more senior professors, like really demonstrate your singular impact in this world and all that kind of stuff. But now as, as sciences and engineering are merging, I mean, there, there's still some noise from that. And like, oh, what did you do on your own? What did you really do on your own? And God knows how much I've heard that, right? Um, and I, I think unavoidably, I think, you know, my, my priority has been, and Erin Min knows that very near and dear as well, right? You know, I'd rather challenge myself and like feel daunted and collaborate and, and learn in the process. And then, you know, eventually the impact will be there and some people are going to shut up and others are not. And that's fine. I think the net effect is going to be better. And 
I think in, in isolation, you will do a linear progress. With other people, you're going to do a much more exponential progress. So, um, and it's, it's how you solve problems. I mean, solve problems are now at the interface of disciplines and, and, and expertise. It's, they're not anymore in, in those circles, it feels like. I, I have a friend at another institution who let me know that just recently they brought in a very strict scoring system for publications in which they're oh. looking at exactly which author are you, what other faculty were on the paper, and they're basically treating it like a sum zero game. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's the wrong answer. Yeah. I, I can say that, right? I can just say that. I'm free to say that as a professor. I, I That does not promote collaboration among faculty. No. Yeah. Data, would you guys, would everybody here on the call believe me if I said in industry, you're swimming in excellent data? I was surrounded by amazing data sets, practical problems. I had days where I would, I would be called into a room with a team, solve a problem, deploy the solution by that afternoon, go home and just be happy. Because that day I added value, I did something really cool. That can happen in industry. You can have those kind of short-term wins. It can be really rewarding. People can send you little like internal to the company awards, like a $50 gift card to Amazon. Way to go award, Michael. Great job. It's, it, there's so much like padding on your back and, you know, that kind of, you know, surrounded by practical problems you can solve. Very rewarding. Academia, it can be difficult to find data. Agreed? Company data can be very difficult to get. Carlos, do you have a question or comment? I see your hand up. Uh, well, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you, Carlos. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm, I, I'm on my iPad. This is the first time, but I'm curious about if you encounter a situation where you, you want to question the, the integrity of your data set, how do you go ahead and raise a red flag? Because integrity is a huge thing now. Like, how do you know someone's not making something up or doctoring some of the data? Well, and so this is a good question. Well, first and foremost, um, in academia, even if we can get a hold of data, it's very difficult for us to have rights to basically publish that data directly. Um, if we're talking about repeatable research and transparency, which is the ultimate goal, that's where we want to get with open research, this is still greatly challenged. If we can use the data, often it'll be a case of it has to be sanitized. The location has to be hidden somehow. And, and so that does go against, Carlos, um, that kind of deeper goal of what you're talking about, of having real assured uh, confidence in the data sources that you're working with. Um, when you work inside the company, you have access to it all. It's all laid bare and transparent. You can see exactly the, the chain by which the data was created, all of its steps. Now, I'm not going to say data curation is always excellent. Would you believe me that sometimes there's issues in how data is handling? I'm not suggesting tomfoolery. What I'm just saying is that maybe the documentation, maybe the tracking and, and how we you know work with that data can be challenged. Yeah, I, uh, Carlos, this is, a, this is a great question. Now, there, there's something very interesting and that is I work in geostats and I've been known to say that if I can't find the data, I'll make it up. Now, don't take that the wrong way. I don't mean that to mean like we're, you know, cheating or something. What I mean is that what you can do is you can create realistic subsurface models, run your physics-based models on them, and then from that extract truth models and sample data and, and test, perform really difficult and challenging tests on your new proposed methodologies. I think in the subsurface, sometimes we can do that. Sometimes I like using truth models because you really do have a ground truth to test it against, right? Our data has way too many levels of interpretation, especially if we're dealing with really deep resources. It gets very complicated. Okay, feedback, and I've said this before a little bit, in industry, you get frequent, often consistent. What I mean by that is um, with a limited number of stakeholders and clear metrics, from year to year, you know where you're at. I used to tell my people when I, when I was a team leader, when you come into your final annual review where I assign your rank, like your, you know, your promotion and so forth, there should be no surprise. You should know where you were headed. 
because I made all of my expectations and metrics transparent with you. I worked with you during the year. Everything kind of tracks nicely. It makes a lot of sense. In academia, your feedback is much less frequent and it may not always be consistent. But I got to tell you, I hope this is okay for me to include this here. This is a couple of quotes anonymous from students from course feedback. This makes my day. This kind of makes my year. This makes me excited. This validates me. It makes me think, hey, it was good I came to academia. We're changing lives. And so th maybe that's good enough for me. But it was more consistent. Um, I had good advice from my old PhD advisor. They said, if you go to academia, you're going to have to give that to yourself. You know that little voice inside that says, you're doing a good job. You're, this is great. Um, that, one that, that one that defeats imposter syndrome, the one that strikes it down for you, you got you to gotta nurture that, that voice in you. You need that. That's going to help you in academia. Okay. Changing lives industry. You can be a great mentor. I had great mentors. I had people who taught me so many great things. I still remember them and I appreciate them so much. You can maximize the potential of your people. You can lift your people. That's what great leadership is. Academia, you can be part of making the next generation of engineers and geoscientists. Guess what? The first chance I had to sit on the stand behind the Dean with all of the graduating engineers, and the, you know, associate deans so I could be right there and just take it in. And I was wedged between like in really uncomfortable with faculty. It was such a great experience to be part of that. It's just amazing. Okay, let me make a couple final comments. Are we good? How's your energy level? Was I hope that, all right, Katerina. Wow, that was stoked. I love it. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the thumbs up. Raymond and, and Laura and all and Adeline, thank you. Um, you don't have to choose. Do you have to choose? Well, working in industry, I wrote about 40 papers, the textbook and was an adjunct PhD committees, Rice University, University of Minnesota, I don't know, a bunch of schools. It was pretty cool. Well, working in academia, I taught 1,700 working professionals in 44 engagements last year alone. Zoom meetings, isn't that efficient? I can just get in, get up, right? I don't think you have to totally choose. I don't think it's a binary choice. I think you can be like a fuzzy logic kind of in the middle there, right? You can find a role in industry that satisfies your academic interests. You can find a role in academia that keeps you connected to industry and practice. I think you can, I think you can kind of do both. Working with students is amazing. I love it. Full of enthusiasm, excitement. It makes me just excited about what everything I'm about everything I'm doing, sharing knowledge, experience, mentoring, coaching. Um, for me, this is a chance to really give back. And so education changed my life. I want to pay it forward. I want to change other people's lives. This is my PhD team with some of their friends, 13 PhDs, pre-COVID. That was pre-COVID, okay, y'all? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have eight kayaks in my garage. I do take my students out on kayaking trips where we all have our own kayaks. We can socially distance. And so I still do that. The future, I really do feel like I'm part of something amazing. I really am appreciative to the University of Texas Austin for this opportunity. I don't know where I'll be in the long term. I don't know where I retire. I may retire in academia. I may retire in industry. I hope you hear that. Not a lack of commitment, but a love for both. I love both lives that I lived, and I don't know how this turns out. I'm full of gratitude for all the amazing students, faculty I've got to work with. But let me just leave you one thought. Regardless of your choice, it will go fast. It was not long ago I was in your position, students. I was thinking, where am I going to end up? What's going to happen? It was frozen and cold in Alberta, Canada, and I had no idea I was going to be living in Texas. I met many mentors that were retiring. It was really cool. There was a, you know, you heard about the demographic kind of bubble in the energy industry, a lot of retirements over a couple of years. A lot of my mentors retired before I left industry. One of them who I really respected a lot took me out for a lunch their last day. And they said there was highs and lows. You're going to win in statistical expectation. You guys know what expectation is? Anybody want to jump in with a definition? Expected value? probability weighted average. I'm just being fancy.
Nancy. You know what I mean? On average, you're going to win. But what they told me was in the end, it was all about the people. That's what really mattered. And so I really do believe in that. I'm excited about that. If you are interested, I do provide a summary of some of my thoughts around academia versus industry in this document right here. I've tweeted a couple of times. I can share it with you. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for the great talk, Professor Perch. Um, I know we all enjoy it a lot. And I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much for the celebration emojis and claps. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Please, Lori. When you were working in industry, how did you balance the time between working on company projects versus working on um, like research and site publications as well as adjunct professorship? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. Great question. Yeah. I was fortunate that I had very good alignment in the company with regard to my publishing activities. It was seen as value to the company because it was promoting um, the company as a partner of choice to all other companies, national oil companies and so forth. There was quite a bit of support for me to attend conferences. There was support for me to be an adjunct professor and visit universities and teach and so forth. Like it was really good that way. At the same time, you saw like 40 peer review publications over that time and a textbook. Um, I didn't just do that at work. I was now what's fascinating is inside of a company, you know, with work life balance, there was an expectation for me to just to use regular office hours for my work projects. And then I did, I honestly did use a lot of weekends and holiday time to help on writing papers and all these kind of other activities. At the level I was going at, that was unavoidable. If I had settled into just maybe, you know, a couple publications every couple of years and kind of a slow. Thank you for the question, Laura. I appreciate it. I have one. Like some people don't get stressed. Some people get excessively stressed. Some people manage. So, uh, and I know that the sources of stress can be different between the two worlds, but I'm just like wondering which, how has, how has it felt? Yeah. So, so stress has impacted me at my, in my career. I'll, I'll tell you one thing is that when I was inside the company, um, some of the, there was the surge. There was the big project, the big presentation, the big rollout of the product. The, the first days I became a team leader. Mm -hmm. The first days I took on an entire research portfolio worth several millions of dollars per year. Like those were the time that I presented to upper, upper, upper VP management, you know, in a big company, it was a big deal. Those things did cause stress. Um, a lot of professional development and so forth. It was surge. It was temporary. Uh -huh. The other thing that was very interesting is if you did have stress inside of the company, you could say something and the culture promoted that. And there was, there was employee support services that would step in and say, Hey, 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 go talk to someone. And they start to talk about diet and sleep and exercise and the things you can do to cope. I found that very supportive, very good. The thing about academia that I do find is that you wear all the hats and, and to some degree, it can feel like it's, you're isolated a bit that you have to stand, you have to do this. I have 13 PhD students. I need to keep the funding for all of them. You know, that kind of thing. Um, I, I try to get them internships. I try to support my students everywhere I can. I have an open door policy with my undergrads, my courses. And so I have students who uh, have trouble learning the content. I want to help them out. That can all cause kind of a general level of stress that can be continuous. Mm -hmm. I think that can be more difficult to deal with Okay. because I think the surge you can kind of cope with and you can say, I need to get over this. I, in my experience in academia, I think the stress is kind of more, you know, there's just kind of a constant drone of it would be my, the way I would model the function. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Does Thank that help? You. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, it does. And I think it, it matches many of my own uh, ideas and uh, experiences without having worked in industry. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it's really interesting because my own advisor in, in the past, when we were having some equivalent form of this talk, um, the, the idea was that in academia, the highs are really high and the lows are really low. While in industry, it's a little, it's a smaller amplitude, but it seems like this is a re inverse relationship for the stress. Yeah. So, so, so you're definitely in the industry, you're insulated somehow. 
Yeah. There's shared accountability on the team. Yeah. And I think what causes what causes the, what I described as kind of these surges is because you're feeling of responsibility to the team. Yeah. You're feeling your resp- Well, whereas in academia, it can sometimes feel like you're in a fight and you just keep getting punched it, at times because it's like, oh, I have this funding. This company said they were going to fund. I planned a student and guess what happens? Something happens. The funding gets canceled, right? Oh, yeah. And then you show up and you're at a meeting and then you find out, okay, then you get a review back from a paper you're really excited about and it was a negative review or a rejection. You, you know what I'm saying? Like it really does. But then, but then suddenly you got that funding and then suddenly that paper got accepted. So I would agree. But what's interesting, I think, is that anticipation of that amplitude causes that droning kind of just generalized stress. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. No, I appreciate the feedback and also your comments, your insights on it. That's helpful to me. I think um, the Jan has a question. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yes, I had a question, but I know that we are over time. So I'll try to make it uh, brief. But I was just curious about your perspective on research itself. Uh, I know that you already talked about some aspects of it, like collaboration and mentorship. But what are the main differences in your point of view uh, with regarding to resources, resources being the principal investigator versus working on a team and just in having disagreements and what kind of scientific questions you ask, what's the depth of understanding that you're looking for? So just, yeah. These are really good questions. The first comment I'd make is just around general quality of research. I, I observed occurrences where the research inside the company was cutting edge where the research inside the company was leading the world, even relative to academic institutions. I remember visiting academic institutions and having professors wanting to partner with us, not for funding, but to be part of the research because they saw it was, it was ahead. And so I, I think that's very important. I think that's a really good comment on research. Now, the other comment I'd make is that when you're inside a company, There is a win together attitude, but there's also very much a consensus and let's move together attitude. And so as a result of that, it was very rare to see competitive research from the standpoint of research that was actually uh, fighting against each other. You know what I mean? Not in alignment with each other. I'm not saying that we weren't capable of the scientific method and being critical and trying new things out and trying to disprove our work, but I'm saying that, that there was a unity working on a team to get the problem done. And I did enjoy that very much. Um, of course, in academia, we are expected as students, you know, the nice thing is uh, junior students, we see the ideas by the time the junior students become senior, you hope they exceed it. Uh, it, it really does have to come from you. Now, you have that opportunity to step back and ask yourself how you can change the world how it can do something very different. And then that very, very strategic research can be difficult to sell inside of a company where you say, I want to spend time on something that I think is a 20% chance of success. And I think it could change the world. Uh, it might be hard to sell. Does that help, Diane? No, oh, yes, that was a great answer. Um, thank you. All right, no, great question. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um... I also have a, a, a question. So when we see someone who is successful and is having a lot of impact on the world in the research community or in any community really, we think that that person has already a lot of skills and a lot of, that, that person was born with that. Is there, any, is there any skill that you developed over the years that you knew it was important and you put your effort on it, on developing it? from early on communication has always been a focus for me Mm -hmm. Um, i was a student in undergrad who was more comfortable presenting in conferences presenting in front of groups Um, it was something i was so bad at it in high school i took a zero on when there was a presentation and so somewhere between high school and university i realized i had to i had to do something about that gap And then what happened was I immediately got feedback. I immediately realized that that could have an impact in job interviews and elsewhere. And so communication skills. 
Now, as I'm a professor, I'm starting to realize, you know, my first students, my first early uh, draft papers for my students, I was very soft. They'd send me a paper. It didn't have major grammar issues. The science looked pretty good. All right, this looks fine. Let's send it in. I have changed. My students now get the first draft. Usually I don't get past the introduction because it's just soaking red and markup. You know, it's like, okay, now take this and fix the rest. I become harsher when it comes to writing. And I, I think if anything, I think good communication skills from writing, I think that's a good skill to develop early. And I'm starting to, you know, I'm, I'm definitely learning and able to mentor my students more on that. That's been a skill I've had to kind of develop as a professor. Yeah, thank you. I guess no one would guess that you were struggling with communication skills at any point. You should have seen me. <laughs> Are we on Twitter together? Yeah, exactly. Alberta. I did my master's from there. Hey, yeah. howdy. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you so much. So right now I'm in Montreal. So I was wondering that is it more rewarding to do a postdoc or, or it's, it's more rewarding to go to industry for a couple, couple of years and then come back to academia? Like which one the selection, selection committee prefer? Like someone from a postdoc two years or someone from industry? Uh, this, now that is really... Okay. Okay, and th so first of all, that's an awesome question. Can I just admit to everybody on the call that I am outside my domain for sure on this one? Because that's a very tough question. I would suggest it depends very much on the department. I happen to come from a department who respects industry experience. If you look at many of the full professors in my department, they have five, 10 years experience in industry. It's not atypical, it happens a lot. Um, that's not the same for every department for sure. Um, the other thing too is, you know, having been a professor for a while and looking at candidates that we consider for hiring, you do have the people who have the incredible, incredible postdoc experience where they produce a huge number of publications and so forth. It's hard to compete with that. You know, they work with an exceptional professor, you know, that must do a lot to shape and mentor on how to be a successful professor. I, I, it must be great. I, I, in a way, I wish I had that experience too. Yeah, I, so you'll notice my answer is soft. I should have just said, I don't know. Yeah, good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions. By the way, there are many good comments in the, in the chat. Um, can read some of those. Wait, um, wait, before anybody else leaves, we need to get a picture together. Oh, that's true. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I should have said that already. Anybody else on the call, can you turn on your videos if you're comfortable? Can we get a picture? Are you guys good with that? Can I put it on Twitter? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. So who do we have? Leticia, thank you for joining in. I appreciate that. Oh, oh we got more people. <laughs> okay, this is excellent, guys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get my um, screen capture program going here. Okay, everybody kind of, you know, get yourself settled in here. I'm going to give you a count of three. Okay, let me, just, let me adjust my camera. I'm cutting off my head a little bit. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. All right, that looks great. It turned out really nicely. Everybody's smiling very nice. Thank you very much, y'all. Um, also, if you don't mind, just quick comment. Thank you so much for presenting. It is I have been to a lot of like industry versus academia because I'm like, oh, I'm about to graduate, don't know what I want to do. And, you know, a lot of times I leave feeling overwhelmed and with a list of things I should do, things that I, you know, should think about doing. And it's just really refreshing to hear on a, a presentation just describing your experiences, but from a very positive perspective. Um, and after this, I'm leaving with like a lot of like, I guess, excitement about my future instead of just like, oh, still a lot of things to do. The, our country needs people with education in the fields that we're working in. Uh, the, I'm excited for you. I'm a, if I could go back in time, what I would tell myself is don't worry so much. It's going to be a great ride. It's going to be a great journey. It's going to be amazing. And so I am excited for you all. And thank you for the comments. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time and the effort you put in preparing the presentation and giving all of your 
advice and experience. And thank you from everyone for joining. Um, if there is no further comments or questions, I guess we can call it a day. And I hope to have you sometime in person here at UC Davis and enjoy your talks and your advice.